All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first thing to check, is this on? Can you hear me all around the room? Very good. Uh, warm welcome to all of you. Um, if you don't know me, I'm Gavin Kelly. From I'm the chair of the Resolution Foundation uh, and always, always happy to come to Bristol, as, as I often do for the great events you run here. Um, today, we are talking about boosting prosperity across Britain. Uh, and you're going to hear a lot about kind of a UK-wide agenda that we have been working on. Um, but we're also going to try and then translate that a bit into what that means for Bristol. And we've got a great uh, set of speakers who are going to do some of that translation for us. The background to today's event is that we at the Resolution Foundation have been working on a project called Economy 2030 for almost three years. Um, and uh, we've done it jointly with the London School of Economics. Uh, and it was kindly funded by the Nuffield Foundation, I should say. During that, um, we produced about 70 reports on all different aspects of British economic and social policy, looking across a kind of a two decade timeline about how we can improve uh, the performance of our economy uh, and also become a fairer society in the process. Uh, we launched the uh, conclusions of uh, this report because we brought it all together into one book, which many of you have just picked up for a very reasonable price of uh, nothing. Uh, uh, we launched that report just before Christmas with Keir Starmer and Jeremy Hunt and oodles of other great and good of the economic uh, and social policy world. Um, and we uh, we are taking that argument, if you like, um, on tour. Uh, uh, it may not quite have the buzz of a Taylor Swift uh, tour, but we have generated great uh, audiences like today's and great discussion in our events so far and we've got many more events uh, because we think it's a really important uh, really important topic and uh, there's never been a if in my view a time where we need to have a, a sort of debate about how we grow our economy in a different way uh, as much as we do right now um, and indeed just doing it today to that as I guess all of you know we had the budget yesterday and the commentary around leading up to the budget and around the budget is kind of almost everything that we don't want in a way. It was kind of like a very, very short term, hyper political way of framing economic policy. And I get it, you know, it's election year, I've worked in politics, I get all that. Uh, but that's kind of the problem. Um, and we, I suppose our basic take is that we're in a really serious state in this country. We're stuck in a kind of low growth, high inequality equilibrium. We have done, been so for some time, and that's a really serious issue. And a lot of the commentary about our economic system is profoundly unserious. Um, and so the reason we're kind of investing in trying to get this debate going ahead of an election is because we feel that the stakes are quite high. Um, we also, as you'll hear, kind of are going to really of the view that turning this round is not kind of for this year or next year. This is like a two decade job. So. If you're impatient, I'm sorry. We're all impatient for change in lots of ways, but um, this is a long-term project and it needs to be coherent. Um, we have set out, as you will see, when you all read this book, I'm sure you're gonna read every page, that there's a huge amount on investment, on net zero, on labor market reform, on industrial policy, on social security. I could go on and on and on. You need to work across many fronts and you need to do so coherently. And importantly, and something which we don't do in this country is you need to accept trade-offs. Um, you may have got a free lunch uh, just now, but uh, there aren't many of them and things need to be paid for and trade-offs need to be gripped. Uh, and we talk a fair bit about that. And the last thing I'd say is that, um, as I say, this is for the, our reports about the UK, not about any particular city, uh, less still Bristol, but cities feature really heavily in our reports. And there's no world in which Britain becomes a much more productive, prosperous and fairer society if our cities don't step up in lots of different ways. And cities like Bristol have got a big part to play in all that. Um, we can't do justice to all that in the next hour or so. Um, so apologies, but we'll do what we can. And we have a, a, a really good lineup. Um, we're going to hear first uh, from uh, Nai Cominetti, who's my colleague from uh, the Resolution Foundation. We like to think of him as our very own Taylor Swift. Uh, no pressure. No, uh, when he's not when he's not doing that, he's the principal economist at the Resolution Foundation and uh, and brilliant in all sorts of ways. So we're going to hear from Nai first, who's going to take you through the bare bones of our argument. I'm really hoping we're going to hear from Darren Jones, MP, who, to be fair to him, is busy responding uh, to the budget in the House of Commons, which we always knew was a risk. I'm hoping he's going to join us and look slightly Orwellian on the size of that screen behind us. So um, we'll have to sort of see what point he, he he manages to get out of the house to come and join us, but he should be here. 
And then we're going to hear, I feel I should make you wave, because you're on set in the front row. We're going to hear from uh, our other speakers. We're going to hear from Evelyn Welsh, who is the Vice Chancellor of uh, the University of Bristol, Jessica Lee, who's Director of Strategy at the West of England Combined Authority, and Sally Doherty, who's the Chief Marketing Officer of Graphcore, which is a AI semiconductor firm based here in Bristol. So we are in good hands. Um, and we're going to try and be done by two or soon after two. And we want to get some questions in too. So I need to keep my speakers to time. He says staring at them all. Uh, Nye, over to you. All right. Thank you, Gavin. Um, at Resolution Foundation, we try to uh, make big, important charts. And one way to do that is to do you know, insightful data analysis. The other way is to put them on a cinema screen. So I'm very happy to be talking to you here today. Um, so I'll start with the problem, which is the uh, depressing bit for a few minutes. Then we'll move on to some solutions. And then at the end, I'll try and say something a bit more specific about Bristol. Um, but obviously, I'll be leaving the, the real Bristol expertise to our other panelists. So first of all, um, the UK is over a decade into a pretty uh, serious episode of stagnation. You can measure this in, in all kinds of ways. One way is the growth of GDP per capita. So back in the 70s, 80s and 90s, that used to rattle along at a decadal growth rate of 20 or 30 um, percent. But that growth has really fallen off a cliff in the last 10 years or so. Now, not everyone likes thinking about GDP. It can feel a bit abstract. Some people say it's not their GDP. But I think you'd all agree that wages do matter to you. So that might be more persuasive. And it follows exactly the same trend. So again, we used to enjoy quite healthy wage growth in this country. And that has fallen off the cliff in the last 10 years or so. So this is what we mean when we talk about stagnation. Uh, to make it even more concrete, if wages had kept on growing at the pace they were growing at in the early 2000s, average wages today would be about £10,000 higher. So this is really quite a big deal. And that's the first of a few uh, big numbers in this presentation. Sometimes you'll see economic slides, which sort of make a lot out of some quite small changes. Uh, but here we're really, we really are talking about some quite large uh, numbers. The only other thing to say here is that this stagnation isn't inevitable. So you'll probably see some charts saying, well, the UK looks bad, but so do other countries. Uh, but it is the case, I'm afraid, that the UK has done worse than other countries over the past 10 years. The Chancellor yesterday in his, in his speech said, actually, we've done better since 2010. That's one of those picking the sort of start point of your comparison um, quite specifically. Really, we have fallen behind other comparator countries uh, over the last 15 years. So the extent of this stagnation shouldn't be thought of um, as inevitable in the UK. That's problem number one. Problem number two is inequality. Again, you can measure that in a number of different ways. Uh, this is a fairly standard measure. It's the Gini coefficient for household incomes. Now, you might be looking at the right hand side of that chart, which looks like a flattish line. And it is that inequality on this measure hasn't changed a huge amount in the last uh, 10, 20 years. But it's really the fact that we're living with the explosion in inequality, which happened in the 1980s. So that really changed the picture on inequality in this country. And we've been living with that inequality uh, ever since. And it's the combination of these two things, high, uh, so stagnant growth and high inequality, which we think is seriously toxic uh, and which we need to do something about. Um, where does that leave the UK? compared to other countries. So here we're going to do a scatter plot. On the x-axis, you're going to see countries plotted by their Gini coefficient. So it's that same measure of inequality we just looked at. And on the y-axis, you've got average uh, household disposable incomes. And we're going to break it up into a few quadrants, this chart. So on the top right, you're going to see countries that are richer uh, and uh, but less equal. Bottom left, poorer and more equal. And you're probably, as you can probably guess, we really want to be heading upwards and leftwards on this chart. We want to be richer and more equal. Are there any other countries that fit that bill? Uh, yes, there are many. There are many other countries. So many countries in Europe um, uh, and a few other Anglo-Saxon countries are both richer than us and more equal than us. And at the end of the presentation, I'll come back to this chart and say what, um, what kind of change the UK might experience if it did start moving um, in that direction. This, um, however, is using average incomes. And really the picture um, is, is worse if you focus on the experience of, of poorer households. That is really the problem that high inequality and, and stagnation gets you. Um, one, I think, quite impactful way of illustrating that is to think about 
how a household in this country compares to a household in another country at different points in income distribution. So on the left hand side, we're thinking about a high income household from the UK going to one of these other countries and then saying, how would their income compare to incomes in that country? So if you're a rich person in this country and you go to Germany, you probably think this feels fairly similar. You know, their living standards look the same. They're having the same number of meals out per week. Their house might look similar to yours. And so that's why it's easy to sort of not have this idea of the cross country differences uh, quite so clear in your head if uh, like presumably many of you in this audience, you're towards that left hand side of the picture when it comes to incomes. But for a low income person, you know, this this inequality really is very serious. So if someone at the bottom end of the income distribution in this country was to go to those countries, um, they would see that their income is really much, much lower than their equivalents in those countries. So hopefully that brings home um, quite how serious this inequality problem is. OK, so that's a depressing bit. So in, in terms of what we should do about this, um, I'm not going to cover everything in the book. You'll see that the book goes through how to adjust to uh, net zero, how to adjust to uh, how to improve our trade strategy. I'm just going to do some very brief bits, mainly uh, on uh, investment, because that is at the, the center of everything. Um, but first of all, to start with, so I'm going to do seriousness about growth and seriousness about inequality. And, and, and that is the theme in our book. We sort of uh, lambast people for being unserious uh, about these things. So seriousness about growth. Um, there isn't a way of turning our country around that doesn't involve uh, investment rising. Um, this, um, uh, the UK has been a low investment country for the last 40 years. This is an illustration of that. This is the um, total investment happening in the, in the economy as a proportion of GDP. It's a fairly standard way of measuring this. In the band, which is that sort of light blue, blue swathe, that's the range of advanced economies excluding the UK. So these are OECD countries, basically. Uh, the dotted blue line is the average. And you can see that in most countries, uh, sorry, the average, it kind of hovers around the mid 20s. The UK has been consistently lower uh, in terms of how much it invests in it in a single year. Be, and you know, being a low investment country for one year doesn't really matter. You know, it's not going to change the capital stock. It's not going to change how many factories you have. But if you're a low investment country every year for a long period of time, that really does start to make a big difference. We have some estimates in our book about the the uh, impact that has had on, on on today's economy, but but it is a big deal. It's important to say this is a problem for business uh, and for government. So, uh, in the budget yesterday, uh, that one of the chancellors. Uh, projected lines was for capital spending to be falling. Uh, we think that's uh, bad news, given all the things that the country has to be investing in over the next few years. Uh, but it's also a problem facing business. So business investment is lower in this country uh, than uh, in other countries. Our solutions cover a number of areas. So for businesses, we think it's mainly two prongs. So we would like to reduce cost of investment. And a lot of that is to do with barriers in the planning system. Um, and secondly, we would like to re uh, reform ownership and governance of uh, businesses. There's some evidence that a greater worker voice in a company makes them more likely to take longer term uh, decisions. And also we have um, a fair bit of uh, thinking in our book about how reforming um, uh, uh, pension funds might, might, might channel more money, but that's um, a bit more complex. So I won't get into it. For government, I think the real problem is having a higher target for capital spending uh, but also to end the volatile policy making. So we don't just have low uh, public investment in this country. It's very volatile. That obviously makes it very hard to plan long term projects. Uh, so those are our central proposals there. Um, you might then be thinking, how do we pay for that? So obviously everyone at the moment is talking a lot about tax. This is a chart showing you um, the tax to GDP ratio in the broad sweep over the last 30 years that has been rising partly driven by our population becoming older, uh, health services becoming more expensive. And for all the talk in, in yesterday's budget about the national insurance cut bringing down taxes, really we're still in a tax rising period. So that's the OBR forecast on the right hand side. It is fractionally lower now than it was yesterday before the uh, Chancellor decided to change uh, the NICS rate, but we're still in a tax rising uh, period. Uh, but um, that is, that, that forecast doesn't come along with any improvement to public services, in fact, the opposite. So we do think that we need uh, higher taxes, but of course it matters how you tax. So we would like to tax all types of income the same. In practice, that means raising capital gains tax. 
we would want to reform council tax. As I'm sure you all know, that's based on very old property valuations. It's a really unfair system. Uh, and the various uh, loopholes in the inheritance tax system we'd like to, we, we'd like to close. All of that, we think, uh, our pros on the book, uh, raise uh, substantial amounts of money. And much of that we would want to put towards uh, higher levels of public investment. Um, one more point about seriousness of growth. Um, what we like to push against is um, people who get wrong where we're starting from. So it's important to remember the UK is a services superpower. Uh, this is a contro controversial message in some parts of the country, in particular when I presented this in, in Birmingham, where there's lots of manufacturing, it's, it's maybe a more difficult one to hear. But that really is where the country strength lies. Here I'm showing you uh, total uh, services exports, and we're, and we're only behind the US on this measure. And obviously the US is much, much bigger than us. Um, and I think this seriousness and acknowledgement of where we're starting from needs to uh, flow through our other policies. So it should inform our trade strategy and also um, things like our you know, human capital strategy. Um, I won't go into it, I don't have a proper slide on it here, but also um, one of the reasons people don't like talking about services jobs is that they associate some of those jobs as being low quality. So we have a large number of proposals to improve the quality of jobs. That's a big part of our plans too. Um, I'm going to speed up slightly, only to, yeah, we have lots to say about inequality. Here I'm just showing you that unemployment benefits has been falling over time relative to wages. We would change that, we would link um, benefits to wages. Uh, we have quite a few other proposals too. I'm going to rattle forward to Bristol if you don't mind, but obviously please go and look at the book for more information of all of those. So for cities, our broad messages, and we focused on Birmingham and Manchester in our report, but our broad messages are, uh, about raising the inputs to growth in cities. That, that means more high school workers and more business capital. Uh, allowing city centres to expand and to grow. Better public transport to allow more people to access a centre. And then, of course, tackling inequality. And in particular, that comes down to uh, providing more social housing. So I'm looking forward to hearing from the panel about how those things do or don't relate to the Bristol story. I'm only here going to give a, a couple of charts to maybe get the conversation started. So first of all, it's interesting for me to note that Bristol's productivity, so that's output per job, is kind of a middle to upper end of the UK pack. Uh, and one of the ways in which we try to think about this is how does Bristol's productivity look compared to its input? So one of the inputs to, to productivity is the human capital of your population. And so Bristol's over there in red, uh, vertical axis, you've got productivity, uh, horizontal axis, you've got the number of graduates in the population, and you can see large number of graduates in Bristol, and sort of deep, you know, towards the upper end of uh, the um, uh, productivity across UK cities. And if you draw a draw a line through that, that sort of tells you Bristol's plumb on where you'd expect to be. Now, if you're complacent, you can say, "Good news, we're doing, you know, what the economics asks of us." However, uh, we would say no city should really be happy being on that line. That is not a good line. And that's because overall UK cities don't do very well compared to cities in other countries. So these are those same cities. The data is slightly different, so you'll notice that Edinburgh has bounced around. But you can see, again, the UK cities over there, quite a big gap between London and, and, and the rest. But all of them are shifted to the left compared to French cities. So that's why we don't think anyone should be delighted to be sitting on that, on that, um, on that uh, trend line that I just showed you. So how might Bristol try to become more productive? Well, and again, so please, I'm getting out of my depth here in terms of uh, Bristol knowledge. But first of all, in terms of its city centre, there is some sign here that Bristol could be more densely developed. Uh, it's much less densely developed at the moment than, than Manchester and, and London. So there's some food for thought. However, some people really don't like the idea of, of uh, sort of denser city development and a sort of faster growing center. We did a lot of work in our cities projects to talk to residents in Bristol, in, in uh, Birmingham and Manchester, which is where we focus, to ask residents there about the trade-offs here. You know, do you want a, a more prosperous, prosperous city or not? What kind of trade-offs would you be happy to live with? And this is just one small example of someone saying, actually, I don't want more development in the center. I'm worried that I would just make it too expensive and inaccessible to someone like me. So clearly, you know, faster growth, while, you know, good in some respects, might bring risk to residents. The most important way, I think, of mitigating that is to have uh, proper and sufficient social housing supply. There is a tentative bit of evidence here saying that although, you know, it's fallen off across the country in terms of social house building, maybe particularly so in Bristol, 
I wouldn't get too unhappy about this. You know, those lines look slightly different if you draw the averages in different places, but but certainly there's been there's been less development happening on social housing. Um, but unfortunately, there is a fairly long-standing, I think, you know, uh, existing inequality uh, problem in Bristol, as there is in many cities. But but there some sign in, in this evidence that it might be slightly bigger in Bristol. So here I'm showing you GCSE attainment for free school meals pupils compared to other pupils. You can see Bristol's at the bottom of the pack and, and that gap is bigger than in other cities. So certainly there's an inequality challenge to go along with you know, any hopes for um, uh, expanded uh, growth. Okay, just to very quickly go back to the start then. So you might think that all sounds very difficult. I don't like the sounds of that. What, um, let's just not do anything. Well, again, we would massively resist that urge because of quite how serious this, this sort of toxic stagnation and inequality problem is facing in the UK. So if, if the UK was to, um, we, you know, we're not saying we want the, the richness of the United States with the equality of Norway. We're just saying what happens if the UK moves to become more like those countries that we've plotted in black there? And even if it only did that, which you can see on this graph doesn't look like the most dramatic shift ever. Uh, here's the, the big sort of number finale. The average household in the UK would be £8,000 richer. So, you know, this really is quite a big deal, uh, which is why we take it all so seriously. All right, that's, uh, that's all from me. Thanks very much. Um, thank you so much, Knight. Um, I think uh, other speakers should all come and join us in the right seats. This is where uh, I'm hoping ah, I'm magic. You are enormous. Is that, is it, it's a sort of Orwellian sort of vibe to uh, how you're looking at. But, uh, I think you all know Darren Jones, but you've just been joined by. Hello, Darren. Really, really pleased that you took a minute out um, from responding to the budget to join us. Um, you are uh, got a good, good or mixed, good audience here and a great panel. And I don't know if you managed to hear much of what Nai was saying, but we've just done an overview of uh, our report and touched on a few things for Bristol. And I would just sort of say, first of all, that chart showing where the UK sits compared to other countries just shows you how much, I mean, it can make you feel really bleak, but it also shows you how much there is to play for. Like those countries shouldn't be so different, and, and they are. Uh, and I would also just say, I mean, that's that chart on education in Bristol, just coming, coming, you know, I'm, I'm not from Bristol. I mean, it's a really bad place to be a poor kid who wants to get on at school, like really bad. I mean, I know lots about Sheffield, I know lots about other cities in, in the UK, and Bristol's worse than those places, and they're quite bad. So that is just, I mean, I say that with uh, with love, but um, I mean, it's, that is a staggeringly bad statistic. So I hope we can pick up on that in the discussion. Uh, but I, I'm going to stick with the planned order. So, Darren, if, if, you, if it's OK with you, we're going to turn to you. And uh, doubtless you'll say something about yesterday's budget, but we're hoping you'll also speak to the kind of bigger agenda we've set out. Thank you. Well, great. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry to be quite so uh, such an enormous presence in the room. It's always a bit <laughs> concerning, probably more for me than it is uh, for all of you. But it's uh, great to be with you. And sorry that I couldn't be at home in Bristol today. But um, as you uh, mentioned, obviously, it was budget day yesterday, uh, and so it's a busy week for those of us um, that work on these issues. Um, I just want to say a couple of things, really, um, uh, both as a Bristolian and also as a politician now working on, on these issues. Uh, you know, in Bristol, we can all be really proud about our record and our heritage. Bristol has for a long time been one of the country's great cities, uh, producing enormous amounts of innovation, of ideas, of capacity, um, and our contribution to the country more broadly has been something that we can be proud of, where we generate lots of wealth uh, as a city, which often gets shared more broadly around the, the, the country. And we also know that as a consequence of our record, but also in new ways, we have enormous potential uh, as well. Our great universities, our great entrepreneurial system uh, in Bristol, uh, building new potential off the legacy of older heritage, for example, in the aerospace and advanced manufacturing sectors. And of course, Bristol is a home and a base for an enormous professional services and creative industry sector as well, which are both really key sectors for the UK economy as a whole. Our challenges in many ways are not particularly new. Uh, we've, I just caught the last bit of the presentation, uh, I'm sorry that I was late, I had to be in the chamber, around the inequality 
uh, gap in the city. Anybody knows if you've been here, you know, in Bristol before that we've had that challenge for decades. That's a very personal experience uh, for me. You know, I grew up in a what was then a council flat in Lawrence Weston, first in my family to go to university because of the new Labour Gifted and Talented program, um, and went to a school which now doesn't exist. It was called Portway Community School. It was one of the first academies in the country under the Blair government for improving failed schools. Uh, where when I left, uh, it was about 15% of my cohort that had the minimum standard of five GCSEs at A star to C, including um, English and maths. And I I'm pretty sure that in my year group, it was fewer than five of us that went on to higher education. Um, and that inequality was quite deep in the 80s and 90s. National policy helped some of us to be able to overcome the challenges of inequality and to do well in life. So it's something that I'm very grateful for. But we can see from the data that those policies were helpful when they were in place, but when they have receded, the inequality challenges have come back to the fore, uh, and we see that across the city. The slightly newer challenge, I think, well, partly newer, is around infrastructure and the ability for the city to deliver on its potential and create those opportunities for people. Uh, you all know that we've been talking about the trams and buses for longer than I've been alive. Uh, and that transport has always been a, a kind of big bugbear for people in the city, um, but it still is. Um, we've got some good investment coming in at the moment on urban rail. Uh, the metro bus system has been helpful in connecting particular areas across the city. But because Bristol is such a great place to be and such an attractive place to be, the speed of population growth, uh, not just within the city, but people moving into Bristol, um, has not uh, has not been able to keep up with the infrastructure investment to be able to uh, take as much opportunity from that as possible. And that's why house prices now are particularly high in the city. I think I'm right in saying we're now the second most expensive place in the country to live outside of London, both for buying houses and for renting them. And I see in my constituency in the northwest part of the city that that's pushing out a lot of people uh, who would like to be here and who grew up here. And that's really challenging. You know, parts of my constituency, which were built after the war to be affordable, secure housing for people in areas like the ones I grew up in in Lawrence Weston, but in other areas like Southmead and Lockleys, I'm sure it's the same for other parts of the city. Because of house pressure prices, uh, sorry, pressure on house prices, there are many, many people now that can't afford to uh, live here and they're being forced to move out to the, and I know this phrase is controversial for many people, but the greater Bristol region. Um, or even further afield into South Wales. And that then poses this question of infrastructure, the ability to commute in and around the city region to where the jobs and the opportunities exist. And we've got much more to, to, to do on that. And um, so we had the budget yesterday, and I'll just talk about it a little. There was a bit of a focus in there on infrastructure delivery, and a review has been announced into how we deliver infrastructure better across the country. For many years, Bristol has kind of missed out from big infrastructure uh, ticket projects uh, for various reasons. And we need to uh, think about how we align infrastructure spending decisions to economic growth opportunities more closely. Uh, there is absolutely a case for that in the north and other parts of the country. But I think there's some pent up demand in cities like ours where there's a case to be made uh, around that investment. And, and for those of us on the Labour Party side um, uh, of the pitch, we talk about it in three ways. We talk about stability, uh, investment, and reform. Stability in terms of stability in the economy and in the leadership uh, and around policy decision making. We've had a number of years now, um, probably in the run up to Brexit and then through COVID and the energy crisis and more recently, where things are moving around a lot and investors and others don't quite know where to put their money or the risk is too high. We think there's a huge opportunity, therefore, to unlock investment, especially from private capital to invest in um, our infrastructure and growth needs. Bristol City Leap is a great innovation at local authority level where the council has partnered with private sector capital to try to unlock city level investment and we'll be watching that closely. And then lastly, reform, you might have stability, there might be money available, but how do you do the deals and actually get it spent well? That's gonna require lots of reforms around planning, skills, supply chain, apprenticeships, all and the energy system. Uh, you know, which is contingent on government to get right working in partnership uh, with combined authorities and local authorities. So I'm enormously positive about the potential for Bristol, both in its both in its own right for those of us that live in Bristol and the Bristol region, but also for the country. I think there's much more we can do about optimizing the growth potential with our great cities across the United Kingdom. 
and our ability to be able to roll up our sleeves and, and get on with it. Um, I did not time myself at all, uh, so I'm just going to stop there and, and be led by you. Fantastic, Dan, thank you so much. Um, my, my first question um, is, do we have you for another half an hour or are you gonna disappear? I think you have me for another half an hour, yeah. Amazing, in that case, I'm gonna to go to my other speakers um, and then come back to you, that's all right. Sure. Uh, I'm gonna go straight to, to you, Evelyn, uh, leader of Massive Employer and National Institution from Bristol University. Yeah, thank you very much, Gavin. Um, so I'm Evelyn Welsh, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Bristol. Um, I've been in post for just around 20 months now. Um, and I had my entire previous career had been in London. So it's really interesting seeing the different feel and the ability of an institution like a university, the impact you can have on a relatively prosperous, relatively small scale in comparison to London um, uh, place to be. And that's fantastic because you feel both a sense of responsibility, but like Darren, an enormous sense of if I get up in the morning and roll up my sleeves and all my eight to 9,000 staff and 35,000 students come along with me, the difference that we could make. And we do make a difference. So I'm here really to have a really simple message, which um, whatever flavor of government is in power locally, regionally, nationally, um, universities throughout the UK are part of the solution to the problems we face. And, and actually, we have problems of our own. We, we whinge a lot about our own problems, but actually we are here to help whatever government is in power to find those solutions because we're here for the long term. Um, universities date from either 900 years ago to, in our case, about 120 years ago. Um, something like our National Composite Centre, which is up um, on the outskirts of Bristol, was actually, um, oh, the original idea came from Peter Mandelson, if you can remember that name from so long ago. So long ago. So long ago. Don't tell them I said that, please. And um, so, so these institutions that are created by governments, carried by universities and businesses and regional development agencies together, can actually see through the seesaws um, and make a real difference. And just one statistic, um, the Southwest's research intensive universities, as measured by uh, a London Economics report in 21-22, generated more than 1.7 billion for the economy from research and innovation activities alone, supporting 16,000 jobs. So we can make a real difference. And anyone who um, goes in and out of Temple Mead Station will see uh, what was uh, land for an old post office sorting office. So we did not displace people. We displaced a derelict building. We are putting in a 250 million pound building there, which will be our start. And it is just the start of our Temple Quarter Enterprise Campus, with the focus being on innovation and with investment and support from WECA, for example, for our Quantum Innovation Institute. So the big question for us is, we do know how to generate economic development. We do know how to generate skilled graduates. We absolutely know how to make these contributions to the economy. But how do we do it in an equitable and truly inclusive way that brings everybody along? When you're talking about artificial intelligence, quantum, high-skilled, high-risk, but high-reward entrepreneurship, how do you ensure that somebody who hasn't gone to university sees this as a positive, not just as somebody pushing them out of their old neighborhood? We are working around the clock on just that question, but it's not as easy as getting um, students to come from poor parts of Bristol to university, because the statistic that you just quoted is worse. 100% of Clifton students go on to university, 8% of South Bristolians go on to university and have done so for many generations. So we have real work to do to tackling that fundamental long-term inequality, but we're up for it. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Evelyn. Um, I'm going to move straight on because 
time is not our friend. So I'm going to move straight on um, to Sally, a, a key kind of employer in the city. So your perspective. Yeah, sure. So I work for an AI semiconductor company, GraphCore, based and headquartered in Bristol on the executive team there. Worked in Bristol for over 20 years for various different technology companies. I think the key, there are lots of issues in Bristol around um, housing and around transport, but unless there are jobs and, and employment in Bristol, um, those infrastructure projects will be short-term gains but won't be sustainable in the long term. We need jobs driven by businesses in the southwest. We do have a lot of strengths in the creative industries, in technology, in aerospace. We need to, um, professional services. I think we need to keep those businesses and we need to grow them. Now, there's lots of work that's going on. For example, Evelyn touched on it with the university in nurturing um, startups and new businesses to, to grow and stay in Bristol. And there are a number of um, challenges around funding, again, that Evelyn is um, and her team are addressing. I think one of the things that everybody needs to be aware of is that the, um, and really take seriously, think about the consequences and prepare is for the AI revolution that is coming. It's, it's coming already. As a country, the UK missed out on the internet revolution. We don't have a global social media company. We don't have a global e-commerce company. We could have done, but we missed out on the opportunity. We shouldn't miss out on the AI revolution. What does that mean for Bristol? Why can we not have the first AI driven um, professional services superpower here in Bristol? The, the, the time is now to really drive that because it's coming and we could miss out if we don't take notice of it. Um, so we should be thinking about building new businesses and not just relying on US firms whereby they drive the AI companies and they just offer employment in the UK. We would want we want to keep the assets and the value in the UK. And then the other part of the equation is how do we ensure that the businesses that are succeeding today in Bristol take advantage of the AI transformation early to really reap the competitive advantage that it can bring? Because I believe the companies that invest early in AI will be the ones who take the rewards. We don't want to be the company, the, the country, sorry, the, the city that is in catch up mode because then productivity, if you're trying to improve productivity, it becomes much more about cost cutting. And we want to create the value and keep the value here in the UK and in Bristol. So that's another area that we really need to think about. And going back to the equitable um, side of things, there is enormous value coming down the line, a potential for enormous value from the AI revolution. It is by no means guaranteed or even likely that that will lead to less inequality there's a real risk that it will create more inequality. And it's important that we are aware of that, that we think through the consequences and prepare to ensure people are not left behind. We would rather be the ones who are upskilling their low paid workers today to provide a more skilled role with an AI co-pilot and be paid fairly for that work rather than the other end of the scale being um, somebody who is low paid, has an AI co-pilot, is doing the job of somebody who is a high skilled, high paid role today, but is still paid the low wages. And I think the chances of that happening, if we rely on the US and other companies to drive the AI revolution are far higher than if we own that, those assets that those companies in the UK. So I think there's huge benefit to come from AI. There are going to be new businesses created, but we also need to ensure that we prepare for the impact that it has that may not be as positive. Right. Thank you so much. I hope in discussion we get a, sort of push you a bit on what are the barriers to you investing more and mm -hmm. doing more of the sorts of things that Nye was talking about. Sure. But before we get to that, um, we're going to turn to Jess, uh, who's Director of Strategy at the Combined Authority for a kind of broader city perspective on this. Yes, city region perspective. Yeah, absolutely. So hi, I'm Jess Lee. I'm Director of Strategy for West of England Combined Authority. Um, previously to that, I worked in the Treasury for uh, a number of years earlier in my career. And so I think I've got a sort of interesting perspective now thinking about economic policy 
from a from a regional perspective, um, and having done so, um, you know, a national at a national level um, uh, previously, there are three points that I wanted to make. I think the danger of going third is that a lot of the good stuff's kind of been taken, <laughs> but uh, but there are three points that I really wanted to make. The first being, that I think, the specific set of strengths that we have in Bristol and the wider uh, West of England region puts us in a really good uh, position to be able to drive growth for the for the country as a whole. So. Uh, I think nationally we need to think about capitalising on the strengths of places like this rather than looking at us as being fine without further investment and we'll just sort of look after ourselves and focusing on, on, on other places because it's growth that's driven by places like this that can then go on to create the, 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 the potential for government to invest in some of the really knotty challenges that, 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 that might exist elsewhere. So I think in terms of the sort of specific strengths of the of the uh, Bristol city region that, that, that we have is a kind of combination of our people and our sector strengths that I think is really powerful. So we know we have a huge number, as we saw from, from the slides and, and Evelyn has touched on, a huge number of really talented, innovative uh, uh, people who live and work in the West of England. We, we're an attractive place and we attract and retain uh, talented people. There's a lot of downsides that go with that in terms of, uh, you know, cost of living and cost of housing as, as Darren mentioned but but it's a real asset for us um, and we have a growing population and the bits of our population that's growing is our working age um, uh, sort of sector of the, of, of the population rather than you know many other places where we've got uh, uh, you, you know different bits the, the sort of older over 65 level area of the population spectrum that's growing here we're looking at a growing working age population which is a real benefit for us so we've got these sort of diverse group of really talented and innovative individuals that that that, that live in, in in the region but we also have a really diverse range of sectors of the economy that that we are leading the way in so you know there's there's areas Space and the advanced manufacturing and some of the the, the um, you know high tech and um, AI and all the all the other sort of really uh, interesting areas of the economy. But there's also the kind of cultural and creative sectors which we know as as people from uh, the region are kind of part of our DNA, aren't they? And it's how we sort of think of ourselves as being quite closely um, interlaced with that whole kind of culture and creative economy. And I think we often think about that combination of. The, the different sectors of the economy being quite a powerful mix and it's on the sort of boundaries of of all of that where real innovation can lie and having the opportunity to harness all of that for the greater good of the uh, of the country as a whole to drive economic growth uh, nationally is is a real opportunity that i think government needs to see and and uh, think about in, uh, how it can support us in driving that the, the second point I wanted to make is I think it's really important that that nationally we consider ourselves the country as a whole, rather than sort of trying to move away from this idea of setting places up in competition with each other. And I think the way that the levelling up agenda in particular, but also often government funding um, exercises uh, uh, take shape, they tend to set us up in competition rather than thinking about how can we work together across the country. The UK isn't big enough to have a whole series of competing places. We really need to be taking a, a serious look at what the relative strengths, I think, of different parts of the country are and, and, and building on that and thinking about how they come together to develop a, a, a kind of national network of, uh, of, of areas where we're very clear about what they can contribute um, you know, so, so, so the activity that might happen in the West of England in terms of aerospace R&D or whatever it might be isn't necessarily going to result in manufacturing jobs here, but there will be manufacturing jobs elsewhere as a result. And that's a success for the, for the country as a whole. Um, so I think that it, ensuring government support us to think about a real cold hard look at what everybody's uh, at different areas of the country's genuine strengths are it, it is, I think, um, uh, going to be really important. And the final point I wanted to make, which I suppose I would say, wouldn't I, being from the combined authority, is that um, I think places really understand um, ourselves best, better than central government. So I think, you know, we are here and we're talking to each other and we understand what the challenges and the opportunities in the region are. We also have more skin in the game than we would do if we were in national government. So, you know, when you're sitting in a place trying to write an economic strategy, it means an awful lot more if, you know, your kids are growing up here and this is where you spend, you're, you're living your life. So I think allowing, um, uh, you know, devolution as a, as a route to allowing places to be really confident, to engage with government and with each other about what our genuine strengths are and, 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 and working together as a network across the country is going to be a really important part, I think, of a future uh, national economic strategy. Um, so I think that's what I wanted to say. Excellent. Said very well. Thank you. And if we get a chance, I want to hear you on 
what greater powers a city region like Bristol might want to have, which could make a difference. Um, because I think that is a pertinent question. Now, gather some questions in your uh, mind. We'll take them in clusters. Um, I'm going to kick off with just one of my own uh, uh, while you do that. But when we do come to you, first of all, Darren won't hear you unless you're speaking into a microphone, um, which is a bit unfair on him. So wait till you get the mic and say, tell us who you are. Um, I'm going to abuse my position by, uh, by kicking off. And I'm, Darren, I'm going to ask you a question. Um, and I'm going to get you to take off your MP uh, Bristol hat and put on your kind of national politician hat. Um, now, you've, I think you've got a sense of the report that we published, that Keir launched, uh, along with others. Um, in it, one of the central things that we argue is that there's, there's basically no path for Britain to grow in the way that many of us want it to, unless we invest more. And when I say more, I don't mean a little bit more. I mean a lot more. We talk about, and actually I thought this was at the low end, but we talked about getting to, on public investment, 3% uh, net investment per year, every year for a very long time. Uh, as of yesterday, in the budget, the, the very large cuts, real cuts to capital investment that uh, were set out or implied by yesterday's plans will actually take us down to just over 1.5% of, uh, of GDP, uh, which is just like miles off. Um, now, I know you have an election coming up and I know you're constrained and you're probably not going to announce lots of great policy at uh, this event much that you'd like to. Uh, so I recognise a bit of reality, um, but give us a sense of your ambition here. And I don't, I, I don't want to rehearse the whole 28 billion net zero sort of, uh, let's not do that. Um, but I, I mean, what, what like, uh, do you recognise the need to get to something like 3% as a country? Uh, for us to be at the races, or do you just think that's pie in the sky and yeah, we're at things we can say what we want, it's never going to happen? Where are you? Well, well um, th thanks for the question. I mean, we we haven't set a target, um, but the five missions that Keir Starmer set for us in the Labour Party um, are spearheaded by the first mission on economic growth. Uh, and we're very clear that the route to economic growth, sustainable economic growth, is investment into productive parts of the economy um, and so you'll hear a lot you've heard a lot from us and you'll hear a lot more from us about getting britain building again how we think about infrastructure and major project delivery on technology infrastructure on house building and how all of these different things underpin our ability to grow the economy and get the economy back on track so that we're in a position to be able to do the other missions that we have um, around public sector reform and improving public services and making people uh, better off so the investment question is really at the heart um, of our economic policy. The reality check, of course, is that if we do win the election this year, you know, we inherit what we inherit from the current government. There's nothing I can do about that. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not it's not great. It's, I think Rachel Reeve said this week, they'll be the, the worst fiscal inheritance any party has had uh, coming into government since the Second World War. So we have to be frank and honest about the fiscal challenges that we will that we will face. But also there are some glimmers of hope. Um, the first is really around how government spends capital. Government's not very good at spending its capital budgets. Uh, on average, uh, one pound in every six pounds goes unspent. Um, and the remaining five pounds that are spent, there's lots of projects where there's quite a lot of waste and overspend. So I've been leading a review um, uh, on behalf of the party about how we deliver infrastructure and major projects, which is thinking more about how do you spend your money more effectively, working across departments? How do you make a proper growth assessment in the business case process? so that you try to drive joined up decision-making on infrastructure investment. Um, but also our partnership with the private sector is gonna be key. And you know, you mentioned the 28 billion, this was the, this was the debate about how much public sector investment we might be able to make, which we had to change uh, because of the state of the economy uh, and the way it went on a downturn between first making that announcement and where we find ourselves now. But it was always the case that private sector investment is going to be a huge part of our success and unlocking that is going to be a huge part of our success. And as a consequence of that, you know, I and the team, we talk to investors, whether they're UK investors or overseas investors all the time. And they'll literally come to this office where I'm sat now and say, we have too much money. We need to invest it somewhere that gives us uh, stability, uh, good outcomes, a stable rate of return. We want to invest in the UK. The UK is a good place to invest. But there are lots of reasons why we can't do it right now. And then they list all of the reasons. 
And so there is a job for government to not only improve their relationship with business and investors, domestic and overseas, but also to do the reform piece of my opening comments to make sure that we can do those deals, unlock the investment and get it spent uh, effectively. So it will be at the core of our economic strategy coming into the election. It will be a, it will be a key performance indicator for us in terms of how we're delivering against ambitions. And we definitely need to up the scale and ambition that we have as a country compared to now. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, lots to come back to there. But let's open it up. I'm going to, oh my Lord, we've got, we've got a forest of hands going up here, um, which is great to see. Uh, where is, is there a mic somewhere? Is there a raving mic? Is there? So um, I'm going to take, is there any uh, no. so let's go to the, this gentleman in the middle that he's got glasses if he doesn't mind me saying uh and then there's a gentleman another gentleman with a sort of ready brownie jumper uh you're going back you're going sorry i was like right in the i awkwardly went to the middle of the room sorry um and i'm inviting questions uh they have a question mark at the end and your voice goes up in intonation not speeches uh, and I will I will get grumpy quite quickly because there's lots of people I want to go. I want to go. So tell us who you are. Uh, Mark Willis from Bromford Housing Association. Hello, Mark. Um, I'd like to ask what the role is for anchor organisations such as housing associations working in partnership um, with local authorities, et al, um, to achieve the necessary investment that we need in all aspects, you know, housing, transport, health and education, et cetera to maximise the impact of investment in specific places? Great, good question. And if you could just pass the mic along. Hi, um, Andy O'Brien from Bristol Energy Cooperative. Um, I've been doing a lot of thinking over the last decade, I suppose, really, on how we actually get to the equivalent of a new green deal. And we know about donut economics and the idea that you know, we've got a a finite resources for the world and how we actually deal with that. So we need to focus on what we actually have to prioritize on. And I wonder if if the Resolution Foundation has been looking at modern monetary theory much. This is only something I've come across literally in the last couple of months, but where the idea is that if you've got your own currency, you can print money, yeah. just as we did during COVID. Yeah. And if you manage the inflation aspect really well, that could be transformational for for what what you do. Yeah. Okay. We'll come back to that. I'm I'm gonna. Can we get the microphone? There's a there's. I'm gonna take these two, and then we're gonna go. Actually, your your yeah, good because it's gonna say lots of men. So we've got um, we're gonna take these three very brief questions, and then we'll come back to you. Okay. So if you bring the mic down, sorry, I'm making that. There we go. Focus the team. Productivity would be having two microphones. Yes, I know. <laughs> Come on, Andrew Bristol can uh, have yeah. two microphones. Uh, thank you. Uh, Andy Sellers from the Compound Centre for Doctor Applications, Telephones. So I'm going to link uh, a comment that Professor Welch said and Sally Doherty said. Totally concur with Sally's uh, analysis uh, of the impact of AI. It will be absolutely transformational. Um, Isn't Vardy AI yeah. is going into Bristol, £300 million uh, investment? So to what extent do the panel agree with backing winners? Should we we be putting graphical AI into its unbarred uh, AI. Yeah, yeah let's, let's just take, um, let's just take, uh, tell us your name. Jennifer Churchill, I'm from UWE Bristol. A uh, question for Darren. How helpful is it, given the context of the discussion we've had from the report, to carry on talking about household budget analogies when we're talking about fiscal policy for the government itself? And a really quick other one, just we're talking about partnerships between the state and, and corporate investment. But they also mentioned the Great Leap Forward for Bristol, which uh, is sort of led by Vattenfall, which is which is a state led company. Are we are we kind of holding ourselves back in terms of how we really have an ambition to link with corporate companies? Do we need to get the state somewhere kind of leading or working fully in partnership, not just at the state of finance but in terms of delivery as well thank you okay and then the gentleman it's you yeah uh joe michelle university oh, of west of england Hello, joe. um actually just going to push a little harder on jennifer's first point the bbc report recently into its own coverage and the coverage that gavin mentioned in the introduction is, is often quite unserious said that saying things like the, the nation's credit card is maxed out um is misleading BBC journalists shouldn't do it, and the BBC should challenge commentators and politicians when they do it. So could Darren Jones comment on that, please? And could the Resolution Foundation economists comment on what 
organizations like the Resolution Foundation can do to um, improve this kind of discussion, which is part of the reason I think that we have low investment, notwithstanding tight public finances, of course, which is the reality. Okay, so let's pause. We'll come back to uh, for another round, um, I think and hope. Um, Darren, I, I, I also know you're, you're kind of pressed. So I'm going to come to you first um, because you'll disappear at some point. So you've been asked about the language, I guess, of fiscal policy and, your, and the, the Labour Party's language in particular. Um, and, and I know on this, I mean, I remember hearing uh, here Starmer, I mean, in the last, like in the last month, during making a kind of borrow to invest is the right argument to have point. Um, and he'd been quite kind of upfront about that. So, so there's I feel like there's different bits of language being used. So I think that is an interesting point. But I would also, if you've got um, thoughts on any of the other questions, Darren, um, whether it's anchor institutions in, as, as a kind of key vehicle for investing in Bristol, uh, this is your chance. So thank you. Sure. Thanks so much. And thanks for the questions. And I'm, I'm sorry that I, I have to go at 2 p.m., uh, sure. uh, but happy to answer them. Um, firstly, on the, on the country's credit card. Uh, so when I did the media round yesterday morning in advance of the budget, I used, the, I used that phrase. Um, and uh, my team spotted that lots of people were getting quite animated about it on social media. So uh, let me just explain why I used that. Um, uh, the reason I use that is because what is a credit card? It's borrowing money that you pay back later. Uh, there's an interest rate attached to it and you get a credit limit on your credit card. And the reason we use that analogy is because if I talk about um, fiscal rules, which is the credit limit on the credit card, um, or I talk about the uh, interest on the national debt, which is easily comparable to interest that you pay on debt, and then you talk about national debt, you're trying to communicate these things in a plain English way um, to the public. Some people have good understanding of these things, some people don't. So you're trying to find the language to make it understandable for a broad range of, of, of viewers. And I'm afraid I'm not somebody that signs up to the kind of MMT um, uh, approach to fiscal policy. And I'm afraid there is a limit to the, about, uh, to the amount that a government can either borrow or print. Um, and we've seen the consequences, not just in our country, but in others where you get that balance wrong. Um, and that's not the approach that an incoming Labour government would uh, would take. And so I, I stand by my language of the country's credit card, because when you have a fiscal rule, a credit limit, when you have an interest rate, when you have borrowing, I think it explains it in a reasonably good way. And, and, and one of the key messages, really, is that one of the problems we have as a country right now is not necessarily that the national debt is around 100 percent of GDP. Uh, although that is high in a post-war context, not high in a longer term context, but high in a post-World War II context. The problem is that the cost of that debt is increasingly expensive because the government borrowed it on variable interest rates, not fixed interest rates. So in the last financial year, taxpayers, we taxpayers, paid over £100 billion in one year just paying the interest on the national debt. That made it the third largest department in Whitehall. And so the more debt that you take on, especially in an environment where you might not be able to control interest rates in the way um, that you might like to, you take on the risk or the burden of having to pay off the interest in your debt first and having what's left um, uh, to be able to go to, um, to other departments. Um, just very briefly on two other things that I pointed from the questions. We agree about the role of um, state-owned institutions in the net zero transition because there are things that can't be delivered on a purely commercial basis uh, by the private sector. There are technologies that we can risk share and co-invest in. Uh, that's why in you know, the Labour Party we talk about GB Energy and our National Wealth Fund. And lastly, just on housing, um, look, it's really, really important. I, I'm a big believer in place-based decision-making. Um, that's why I've always been supportive of uh, Marvin Reese's approach to kind of the one city conversations where he brings different budget holders, different providers, different leaders together to talk about the same topic. And because the consequence of failing that has real life implications for people. If I take one constituency example, Southmead Hospital, huge employer in the city and the region, uh, was struggling to be able to recruit midwives because the midwives couldn't find any housing that they could afford to live in that was within commutable distance to the hospital. Uh, and so we've had some great projects locally where uh, philanthropic funds and impact investors in the city uh, region and others have come together to build housing uh, to be ring fenced for healthcare workers. And if you don't have the healthcare workers in the health system, you don't get through the backlog, which limits uh, participation in the labour market. So absolutely, the different parts of the economy should be speaking with each other in what we would call a mission-led approach to national policies and national uh, national priorities. 
Um, uh, but there's the bongs in the background. So hopefully that was okay in terms of answering the questions. Thanks but, for having but, me. Yeah, and, Aaron, hopefully... Thank you so much. Thank you. I know you're really busy. So that gets give you on. Thank you. No problem. Thanks. Right. Um, if our speakers are pithy, yeah. then we'll take. We'll have time for a few more questions. So I, I'm going to turn and just answer the ones you feel yeah. you've got something to say. So anchor institutions like Housing Trust, absolutely. Um, University of Bristol and you, we are currently in conversation about intergenerational housing, which we can um, work through where where students and people in need of elder care actually live together and are mutually supportive. So those are incredibly important conversations. And um, on GraphCore and Isambard AI, and um, state aid rules or um, prevent us at the moment from uh, using what is a national facility, which will be again, just on the outskirts of the city of Bristol, Bristol city region. And um, uh, that's gonna be fantastic, but for pre-commercial work and um, eventually obviously we would like to have something an intermediary zone like a catapult as we have with the aerospace industry which would allow us to join up the r d work that we do with the commercial work that something like graphcore does but actually it's important that we don't try to be a business in competition with graphcore and graphcore mm -hmm. can rely on the university of bristol to do the really long-term work i mean much of the quantum work that we're spinning out now as companies started way back in the 50s and 60s. It can take that long. Thank you. Sorry. So on the, um, I'll take the, the partnership between um, private and yeah. public sector and on the Isambard thing as well. Um, I think it's really important that the government does um, include when they're partnering with, with commercial entities that they consider UK businesses and not just US businesses. So a lot of the investment in AI with the current government is going directly to US companies. Um, we've been, we were, in fact, we were excluded from the Isambard AI um, um, contract. We, we, were, we weren't able to provide our kit into it um, for reasons unknown to myself. Right. And I'm also concerned, for example, the um, announcement yesterday about improving productivity in the National Health Service through AI. I think that is great. Government has an issue with large scale IT problems, but putting my cynicism aside, I think there's definitely a, um, a role to play there and the AI can improve productivity in many of these public services. However, again, the, the direction of travel is to give those contracts to US firms and not UK firms. I think that really needs to be considered because if the investment continue goes into US firms, it becomes circular. The UK firms can't compete or go out of business and it will only be US firms. That's not an area that Graphcore would ever pitch for, but it's, I know that that's something that's happening. Um, so I think that that partnership with the commercial sector needs to be considered whether they're UK firms or not. Thank you. Um, Jessica? Yeah, well, very briefly, I suppose, just on, on the question about um, anchor organisations like housing associations, I think I agree with the point about the, the one city model. I think the, 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 the value of working together uh, to identify the sort of scale of the challenge, the, the, who can contribute what to uh, resolving some of these really knotty issues, because no organisation can do this in isolation. And it's only when we bring, all bring the resources at our disposal uh, to, lined up behind the, the challenges that we're going to be able to address any of them, really, particularly the housing one. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, you asked, I was asked a question, or we were asked a question about the Resolution Foundation and macro. Shall, no, shall I just, um, uh, longer conversation. I, the report, there's a really good report by the BBC about how to communicate and economics effectively. I thought it was, well, I, I basically agreed with pretty much, not all, but pretty much all of it. And I don't like household analogies by and large when you talk about economics. We uh, avoid them, uh, I, I hope. Uh, I don't check every single thing we write on this, but I, we avoid them. Um, I'm not totally relaxed about where we are as a country on debt. I mean, it could go higher and the lights wouldn't go out, but I actually think, I, you know, that, that doesn't mean that we don't think there is a really serious question about how we manage the sort of debt burdens over time. And um, we take that really, really seriously. Uh, but I don't think the way of informing that is household analogies myself. Uh, right. Uh, wow, bloody hell. Um, we, uh, people, are, so we're, gonna, we're not going to take all the questions. We'll take, I'm going to go to, I can see a lady there, and then I'm going to go to the gentleman just on that side, and I think there was one over at the back, and we're probably going to have to, if you're really quick, we'll see what we can do. My name is Isabel, and I'm an economist in the civil service. 
you've spoken a lot about higher education. Yep. What about further education and vocational uh -huh. graduates? What role yes. do you think they should play? Thank you for asking that question. It's vital someone did. Yeah. Uh, Matt Griffith from Business West, Business Leadership Organization. Thanks very much, first, for the seriousness of your work and the report is excellent. And you're right about the points about short termism. Just wondering, in that mode, how do we as a city region get more serious um, in terms of delivery of the, of the big things? Um, how do we do that in terms of governance and political leadership? And how do we do it as a city region as a whole? If you have reflections as a panel, that would be great because it's, it's a massive challenge you set out. Okay, and as the mic travels back, and I'm going to ask Jess to answer that, and I'm going to throw in my rider to that, which is, do you need fis more fiscal power? I don't mean this year. Like, over the next 20 years, if, do the city regions of this country really need to be able to have some sort of tax base to do their job properly? We'll come back to it. So just, well, <laughs> but that's, I want, I, I'd like you to speak to that because I kind of think you do. Uh, let's um i think there was a gentleman oh no i can't see him i'm afraid it's dark yeah there's a gentleman i think at the back of the question or maybe i maybe it was a mythical try to follow on that. all right let's take well I'll, I'll, I'll be if there's a let... the, the man there has been has his hand up at the very beginning oh i'm sorry uh -huh. i missed you he was literally at the very beginning just yeah why, why don't you uh -huh. you can just if you speak loudly yeah, yeah. no no <laughs> behind you okay microphone otherwise well people won't hear sorry we are rushed yeah, thanks. Uh, good afternoon, Paul Fox. I head up the government's money and pension service for the southwest of England. Come over from Dorset for this. Um, I just wanted to put on, uh, I suppose, the panel's radar, um, an important topic that I think has over a 20-year period of, of looking forward here, a real opportunity to impact both inequality in Bristol and across the country um, and prosperity, and that's financial education. There are not enough children and young people getting... Um, a solid enough financial education and learning about the basics of money in this country and in this city that is proven to go on that the more they take on they they will make more positive decisions uh, as they go into adulthood what can the panel do to weave that into bristol policies in the future wow, that's a big one thank you for that and was there a fight you no it was I think that, that guy there yeah. had a question. Did you? Okay, last one. Last one to this just, gentleman. Just a very quick, uh, a quick one. Picking up a point, well, two points really that Sally made, uh, to do with uh, keeping homegrown businesses and the competition markets uh, process in this country has been very much in favour of allowing them to be sold to American companies. So I think there's something uh, that needs to happen there if we can with whichever government comes in next to try and make sure we keep homegrown companies. Um, with, with, with at least a strong UK um, uh, ownership. Okay. I get that we get the thrust. Um, I'm going to come back to the panel because it's uh, we're almost out. Um, Evelyn, speak to the FE point, please, and anything else, just final uh, remarks. So I couldn't agree more. Um, we have a civic agreement with UWE and City of Bristol College and the One City Partnership and the City Council, which is designed to drive exactly that level of partnership. Lots of other examples, but um, uh, it, it's a continuum. And particularly as jobs are changing, um, you actually need to have the, the kind of most blue skies cutting edge um, work that you might do as a PhD student actually is remarkably rapidly translated into what we tend to call vocational training. So you, you absolutely need to be working hand and glove and there used to be something called Bristol Learning City, and we're in conversation about reactivating that. So we do see ourselves as partners. Thank you so much, Sally. So going to the point about the keeping homegrown companies in yep. the UK, I, I don't believe that preventing UK startups from being sold to US companies or other or other overseas um, companies is the is the right solution. Um, because it would mean that they would be less likely to get um, funding in the first place from outside the UK because it would be see the exits would be too limited. However, I do agree we should try and keep those assets in the UK. Um, I think one of the ways of doing that is to ensure that the, the government for some of these public um, um, investments considers using the UK companies for the, for the commercial um, operations that it's investing in. So I think it's important that the UK government buys their services rather than invests in them. Um, and also that they, that they keep the options open. Because I think 
preventing them from companies from being sold overseas would just mean at the beginning there'd be less likelihood of them getting funded sadly okay thank you uh jess so a couple of points to pick up, I suppose, the, the question from Matt about the city the governance and also the point about um, more fiscal power. So so uh, in my view, the, the, the combined authority model is in its sort of infancy. Um, we have been going since 2017. We're, we're a place with quite a diverse politics, as everybody knows, and that's not without challenge when you then seek to bring everybody together and to, to work collaboratively. The model of Greater Manchester is always held up as being the thing to aspire to, but I think that, that in reality, there's a very different, it's a very, very different proposition uh, in Greater Manchester. They have a you know history of working together. They're politically aligned. They may or may not get on, but they certainly all come from the same sort of starting point. Uh, and, and there are far more places around the country like the West of England than there are like Greater Manchester. So for me, if I was sitting in Whitehall, my question for the future of combined authorities, future of devolution would be, how do you make this model work in places that are very diverse and have a range of different political uh, kind of backdrops? And and and, it, and we haven't got the answer here. We're working to towards it. But we definitely don't have the answer yet. And in answer to the point about fiscal devolution, I think absolutely. But I think we need to run, walk before we can run, or whichever way around uh, we need to be. So I think there are, you know, we need to have a solid foundation here. There are other steps that it would be great to take too, like consolidated budgets. At the moment, combined authorities get lots of different pots of money that need to be, you know, spent in specific ways, all all kind of tightly governed by government. We need a, we need to be allowed to have the freedom to spend the money as we think we yeah. need to for the good of our region, rather than it all being so tightly defined. But I think it, we're on a journey. On a journey. Great. And um, no, you've been sat there very uh, quietly. Uh, I've ignored you. I'm sorry. Um, I want you to have the final word, and I want you basically your charts were pretty bloody depressing, <laughs> and I want you to send these fine people off to their afternoons with, if you like, one or minute or so of the case for why things might not be as bad as your charts said. Give, give us a bit of sunshine. <laughs> uh, they are currently as bad, but they don't need to be uh, as bad. Uh, they, You'll go we, <laughs> we, I, was, I was just reflecting, you know, I would very much like to have a, a British um, artificial intelligence company, a British Facebook type of thing, but you can move towards Norway, you can move towards France by just doing boring but good things on the tax benefit system, boring but good things on investing in, in capital spending. You know, the, these are radical by the standards of recent years, but but not really by um, you know the you know looking at other countries. So it really, really can and should get better but, uh, in this country. Okay, you come to the resolution for boring but sensible <laughs> agendas to make the world better inch by inch, but I would settle for that right now. Um, you've been a fantastic audience. Uh, we haven't done the, 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 all the contents of this justice. There's, oh, there's one copy left. My goodness, there's one copy left. Someone take that. Um, do follow our work uh, on our website. We're going to be doing loads of stuff between now and the election to try and, as best we can, raise the level of economic and social debates about the future of our country ahead of an election. Uh, thank you for all your questions. And can you just all come together to thank you? That was a really good panel. So thank you. <laughs>